It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Hugh Clifford Mackay, AO, born in 1938, which makes him one year younger than me. He is the founder of the Australian quarterly research series, The Mackay Report, from 1979 to 2003, which is the scholarly base of his prolific body of work and which over the past 25 years has seen the publishing of 120 quarterly reports on a qualitative social research. He is a psychologist, social researcher and writer and, has a, and was a weekly newspaper columnist for 25 years and has been regularly appearing commentator on radio and television. His first book, on social, on social Analysis, Reinventing Australia was published in 1993 and became, to Hugh's surprise, a number one bestseller and was followed by others. In fact, a total of 22 books, such as The Good Life in 2013, The Art of Belonging, Australian Reimagined, as well as the recent What Makes Us Tick. That was in 2019, to name just a few. Hugh has had a 60 year career in social research and well knows how to bring out the best in ourselves and in our society, in both good as well, troubled, as, well as troubled times. And has amongst many honorary appointments served as the deputy chairman of the Australia Council for the Arts and is currently an honorary professor in the Research School of Psychology at the Australian National University. Would you please join me in giving Hugh Mackay a hearty and warm Sydney Club welcome. Thanks, Hines. Now, Lindsay, uh, there, there was nothing in that about, about you, but I think you're going to commence proceedings with, with, uh, with some words and uh, and then we're going to move over to Hugh. So uh, can I um, please have a very warm welcome for Lindsay Mel. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, thank you, Mark, Heinz and all. I really appreciate being here and on the Gadigal uh, people's land. So uh, <clears throat> Hugh, uh, the, let's start at the beginning. How would you define kindness? And why do you attach so much importance to kindness? You describe it as one of humanity's most precious assets. Can you expand on that idea? Hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Sydney Rotary, for having me. And congratulations, Mark, on being the new president. Um, yes, to, to, to answer that question, Lindsay, I, I, I need, I think, just to remind us of something that seems so blindingly self-evident, you'd probably wonder why I'm bothering to mention it at all. But it's just a reminder that we humans belong to a social species. We are social creatures. That's our absolutely essential nature. And what that means is that we're hopeless in isolation. It means that we need each other. We need families. We need clubs. We need neighborhoods. We need groups, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us and to give us that all important sense of belonging that is so fundamental to the mental and emotional health of human beings. Now, that, that as background, that being the case, it, it comes as no surprise, does it, to, uh, to learn that neuroscientists who can now peep into our brains in a way that psychologists and philosophers could previously only speculate about, but neuroscientists tell us that there is a cooperative center in the human brain. In other words, we are hardwired to be a social species. We're hardwired to cooperate, which in turn, to come to the absolute uh, crux of your question, Lindsay, in turn means that we're effectively hardwired for kindness because kindness is obviously <clears throat> the crucial ingredient in that, that um, vital human project of creating and maintaining social harmony. We cooperate through uh, acts of kindness, mutual respect, compassion, etc., towards each other. So 
it's not surprising, is it, that when you think of all of our psychological needs, it's probably true to say that the deepest, given the context I've just sketched in, the deepest of our psych psychological needs is the need to be taken seriously, the need to be heard, the need to be noticed, appreciated, included. And so I would define kindness uh, it's taken a long time to get to the actual definition, I'm sorry, but I would define kindness as anything we do that conveys to another person that we take them seriously. Anything we do or say that conveys to another person that we appreciate them, that we acknowledge them, that we include them. Uh, that's how I would define kindness. Uh, and as you say, Lindsay, I do think of it as one of humanity's most precious assets, because that capacity for kindness uh, is innate, allows us uh, to act kindly towards people that we can't, don't like. Isn't that an incredible thing about humans? We have the capacity to be kind to people we don't like, kind to people we could never agree with about politics or religion or anything, and even kind to total strangers. So I, that, that's why I rate it as our most precious asset. It gives us the capacity to create social harmony and social harmony is absolutely vital to the survival of our species. It's, it's no less significant than that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Hugh. Well, I, in a way, you've really answered the next question. So <laughs> I probably will go on from that, but the question is, can you give us a particular instance? of what you mean by responding to another person's need to be taken seriously. I think you've done that, haven't you? Is that right? Well, well, a couple of things. Yeah, I could, I could um, say a little more about that, Lindsay. Okay. It, it, let, let's be concrete, because acts of kindness, if you define kindness in the way that I've suggested, an act of kindness could be anything from a smile and a wave and a greeting to a total stranger that you pass in the street or someone you're standing next to at a bus stop. Uh, through to helping a frail elderly person cross a busy street or helping them on or off a bus, uh, looking out for a neighbour who's at risk of social isolation, remembering to go and say hello from time to time just to check in, helping someone um, who's in a jam, Any, anything at all we do that, that shows another person that we acknowledge them and include them. And so I, I think I would say, um, probably the most potent uh, of all the acts of kindness that we can easily perform for each other. I mean, of course, this could include giving a, a bed to a homeless person or taking someone out for a meal. Um, but in, t in terms of our normal everyday interactions, probably the most potent act of kindness we can perform is to be more attentive, empathic listeners to each other. I, I rate listening as one of the most important things we ever do. For, I mean, you're doing this for me right now and I appreciate it. And of course, it's encouraging if someone listens to you because when we listen, I don't, I don't just mean here, but when we're actually listening to someone attentively, empathically, without needing to put it into words, what we're saying is, I take you seriously enough. I take you seriously enough to bother entertaining your point of view, to hearing what you have to say. And that's to, to know that that's true is therapeutic. It's enriching for people to know that they're taken seriously in that way. But notice the opposite, Lindsay. Um, if we're not really listening, if we're looking at our watch or kind of half listening or looking over the person's shoulder in the hope of catching sight of someone more interesting to talk to. Uh, what's the message we're sending there? The, the, the unspoken message is, sorry, I don't take you seriously enough to bother listening to what you have to say. Now, would we ever say that to a partner or a child or a colleague or a fellow member of this club? Uh, or a neighbour, or any, of course we wouldn't. It'd be so hurtful and so offensive. And yet whenever we withhold the gift of attentive and empathic listening, that's the unspoken message that we're sending. So I, I see, I, I emphasise that a bit, Lindsay, because I see that as really, uh, in, a, in a way, the thing that all of us 
could get better at. Uh, and to see listening as an act of kindness, I think perhaps transforms uh, our understanding of how significant it really is. And my next question is that you quote Samuel Johnson a couple of times, uh, very much a figure of the Enlightenment in, in many ways, that kindness is in our power when fondness is not. This suggests that kindness may have an alternative implication from affection. Yes. Can you explain that idea a bit more? And how would you distinguish between kindness and just being nice? Yes. Or between kindness and compassion? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, well, let's start. Um, uh, uh, what what Johnson meant when he said, uh, it's, it's a wonderful quote, I think we should all write this down and stick it on our desk or maybe pin it on our forehead. Um, kindness is in our power, even when fondness is not. It's a reminder of the fact that I, I think of kindness as a unique and possibly the purest form of human love. Now, love is one of those heavily freighted words, isn't it? We say, I love chocolate, I love my wife, I love this book, I love that movie, I love dogs. And every time we say that, we mean something quite different. But all forms of human love are wonderful. Romantic love is energizing and exciting and familial love is remarkable. We, blood is thicker than water. Companionate love is crucial to our mental health. Where would we be without the affection of our friends? But then there is this completely different expression of human love, we're calling kindness, which does not involve the emotions at all. And I think this is, in my own case, this was kind of the breakthrough in my understanding of why kindness is such a valuable human commodity and why we are blessed uh, with this capacity for kindness, because it does not engage the emotions. It's got nothing to do with affection. That, that's the sense in which I think of it as the purest form of love. Because as I mentioned briefly uh, in, in my opening uh, response to your first question, um, we are capable of, I, I do think this is worth celebrating. You know, I think we, <laughs> we ought to every now and then pause and say, what a fantastic species we belong to. We are capable of being kind regardless of our feelings. You can be kind to someone you don't like. You can be kind to someone, when you see someone in a jam, and you don't say, oh, look, I see you're in a jam, but now uh, before I give you a hand, tell me how you voted in the last election. We don't do that. We don't qualify people to see whether they, they are worth our kindness. We're just kind because we're human. It's not heroic. It's just natural for us. Here's someone who's in need of assistance. We just give them assistance. It happens to be pouring with rain. It's inconvenient. We're going to be running late. We're soaked to the skin. But here's someone in need and I'm a human and they're a human. We act kindly, we can be kind. And that could be someone I've never seen and will never see again. And it might even be someone who forgot to thank me. Doesn't matter. Kindness makes the world a better place. Uh, and we're capable even of kindness to strangers. So I think it's important uh, just to emphasize that it's this, this very particular, um, unique, pure, form of human love is unrelated to our emotions, uh, which means we are capable of being kind in all sorts of circumstances, which will make those circumstances easier for everyone to bear. You can terminate a relationship kindly. You can terminate someone's employment kindly. This is not some kind of soft option. You can be tough and kind. You can have a robust argument with someone but do it, just speak your mind, assert yourself, but do it kindly. So I think uh, that, that emphasizes that we're not reserving kindness for the people who we think deserve it or are like us or not qualified in any way. It's a human capacity to show kindness towards our fellow humans, even in the most testing circumstances. And it's all part of this brilliant project of keeping the species going by creating social harmony. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, there's a much more clarity there, I think, when you uh, expound on these different points. You make it clear in the kindness revolution 
that the sort of social changes that have been reshaping Australian society over the past 30 or 40 years have been pushing us away from our sense of common humanity. We might even say our sense of community in, in favour of a rampant individualism. Like many other Western social analysts, you suggest we have been becoming more socially fragmented with less social cohesion and more social isolation. Can you touch on a few of those trends to explain that idea and also say something about the consequences of these? Mm. Yes, thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a, I think, a very sobering moment in our history um, because against the background of what I've been saying about our human nature, uh, and our natural dispositions to cooperate, to recognise our, our interdependence, our, our moral obligation, almost our biological obligation uh, to show kindness towards each other. <clears throat> uh, as you say, when, when we look over the last 30 or 40 years of Western society, and let's just think about Australia, what we're looking at is a really weird social phenomenon. We've been living through a period in our social history where we've been swept by some pretty radical changes, social, cultural, economic, demographic, and so on, um, which have, as you say, been pushing us in precisely the opposite direction from the one I've described, emphasizing our individualism, mm -hmm. uh, um, rewarding our competitive rather than our cooperative uh, uh, behaviour. <clears throat> so yeah, in response to that um, invitation, Lindsay, I'll just very quickly mention a few of the trends that explain, I think, why we have entered this period, until the pandemic, we'll talk about that in a moment, but entered this period where we became more socially fragmented. Uh, our shrinking households, they've been shrinking for 100 years, but the rate of shrinkage, shrinkage has accelerated in, in the last 30 or 40 years, we've now reached the point where one in four Australian households contain just one person. And the Bureau of Statistics says that, that the rate of shrinkage is such that within the next 10 or 15 years, it'll be every third household that contains just one person. Now, I'm sure many, many of you uh, live alone, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that everyone who lives alone is socially isolated. Uh, many people value their freedom and independence and love their so solo householder status. Many other people don't because they're living alone due to bereavement or relationship breakdown or some other uh, uh, life circumstance. But when we live in a society in which every third or fourth household contains just one person, we're obviously increasing the risk of social isolation, the risk of loneliness, uh, and of uh, social fragmentation. Um, I mentioned relationship breakdown there. That's a second trend that I'd, I'd put on this list, and I'll run through these very quickly, but between 35 and 40% of contemporary marriages are ending in divorce. Uh, that's obviously hugely disruptive for the couples and for any kids, if there are kids, and there often are, which is why we have at the present moment about a million dependent kids in Australia who live with just one of their natural parents. Um, but it's disruptive for the family, the extended family, friendship circles, the communities people are moving in and out of, a two-person household suddenly becomes two single-person households and so on. That, that also fuels the process of social fragmentation, uh, as does our falling birth rate. Uh, I'm, I've got nothing against the falling birth rate, but we need to understand how it changes our, uh, the nature of our society, because kids in most neighbourhoods act as a kind of social lubricant. Uh, well, at the moment, relative to total population, we're producing the smallest generation of children Australia has ever produced. And what that means is the social lubricant provided by kids is in shorter supply. Um, I should say, as an aside, we're compensating for that through pet ownership. <laughs> and you know, a lot of those dogs especially are child substitutes because, you know, because they, they've got human names. I recently encountered someone who said they, they it, was, it was pleased to meet me because their dog is also called Hugh. Uh, so there's no end to this. Um, but yeah, a falling birth rate uh, does contribute uh, or increase the risk of social 
um, uh, fragmentation, as does our increased mobility, just like Americans now on average, Australians move house once every six years. And of course, we're more mobile in the sense that we're coming and going by car. Most of us live in drive-in, drive-out suburbs. You wave at your neighbor's car. You hope your neighbor is driving, but it's not the same as stopping and saying good day. Um, that's a, a fragmenting effect, as is our busyness. We're all so proud of being busy, aren't we? We fail to stop and recognize that busyness is the great enemy of social cohesion. Or well, the neighbors are having drinks on Friday. Oh, sorry, too busy. You can't go. Don't, don't interrupt dad. He's busy. Uh, we better watch out for this disease called busyness, which even affected the way we greet each other in Australia. If you notice that, we say, how are you going, Lindsay? Busy? As though, come on, are you dead or are you busy? <laughs> that switch has got to be on or off. Um, well, very quickly, one, one other thing I'd add to this list, of course, it could be a much longer list. But one other thing I'd add to it is the information technology revolution, which, of course, is a paradoxical phenomenon. It's brilliant. It's allowing us to do what we're doing today. Uh, it's promised that it would make us more connected than ever, and it has done that. But it has also made it easier than ever for us to stay apart from each other. And that, of course, has had a socially fragmenting effect. Even now, when we feel as though we're talking to each other, I'm actually talking into a microphone and I'm looking at a screen. We're not making eye contact. It's a very, very poor second to the experience we have when we are relating face to face. Now, I'll stop that little list there, Lindsay, but just, just to wrap, it, wrap that point up and put it all together. Think of the cumulative effect of social changes like that, uh, whether it's our shrinking households or our mobility or uh, our busyness or uh, our obsession with information technology, uh, obviously, cumulatively, that tends towards social fragmentation. It tends towards an erosion of social cohesion and has promoted what we've seen promoted over the last 30 or 40, 40 years, the so-called me culture, where we're obsessed with our own identity, whether it's gender identity, religious identity, ethnic identity, uh, political identity, all about difference, all about uniqueness, all about division, uh, losing sight of the fact that in reality, we all exist in a shimmering web of interconnectedness. We share a common humanity. But these trends have been encouraging us to think not so much about our common humanity, but more about our individual identity. What happens to a society? You mentioned consequences. Uh, what happens to a society? Uh, I mean, Western society has been like a vast social laboratory over the last 30 or 40 years. What happens to a society when it becomes more fragmented, or as the sociologists say, more atomized? Well, we can predict what will happen, and we don't have to predict because now we've seen what's happened. We have an epidemic of loneliness. Before the pandemic, 25% of Australian adults were reporting feeling lonely most of the time. We have an epidemic of anxiety and an epidemic of depression. And that triple epidemic, uh, epi epidemic, loneliness, anxiety, depression, is exactly what happens to herd animals when the herd disperses a bit, when people feel as though they're somewhat cut off from the herd. In our criminal justice system, solitary confinement is the worst thing we can think of is to punish a prisoner. Well, well, we've been experiencing a little more, not exactly social con confinement, but much more social isolation, and it's, uh, it's, it's taken a heavy toll on our mental and emotional health. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for that uh, very comprehensive analysis of what's actually been happening lately to our lives and uh, how we've been traveling. Thank you for that, Hugh. Uh, those trends help to explain the rise of the so-called me culture, leading to an increasing focus on perhaps even an obsession with identity, whether gender, ethnic, religious, political, etc. But don't we need a clear sense of our own identity in order to function? Yes. Yes, we do. And I, I mentioned that in passing there, but no, it's an important point to, to emphasise. And of course, you're right, we do need a sense of our own identity. And all of us live with the tension between 
our sense of ourselves as inter independent individuals, unique, special, different, and our sense of ourselves as members, as belonging, uh, as being interdependent, interconnected uh, with each other. Now, that, that tension is always there. Yes, we do need a sense of independence and personal identity, but we always need to remember that the deeper, I mean, identity is fascinating. Psychologists study it endlessly, individual differences, et cetera. But the, and, and it is fascinating, but the most significant thing about it is about us is not how we're different. The most significant thing about us is that we do share this common humanity. So the tension between independence and interdependence um, can be resolved in either direction and, and at various times and various stages of our lives, we resolve it differently, but ultimately it must be resolved in favour of recognising that we belong to each other, that we are all one. Yes, thanks you for, again for clarifying that very well. Uh, you're obviously hoping that COVID-19 might act as a bit of a circuit breaker, causing us to reflect on where those trends have been taking us. Does history offer us any encouragement on that point? Yes, yes, thanks for raising this, Lindsay. I think this, um, this is the perfect question uh, for us to be thinking about, uh, uh, well, on the eve of December uh, 2021, uh, when COVID is still with us and uh, now a new variant uh, threatens a further outbreak and potentially another spike and all that. Um, I do think that COVID-19, well, it's already been demonstrated somewhat, but COVID-19 has the potential to act as a circuit breaker, uh, it won't prevent all those trends that I briefly described in response to your earlier question, but it might encourage us to think a bit more about the consequences of those trends and to be a bit more mindful of ways in which we can mitigate the influence of those trends. Um, I saw some research that's just been released yesterday, I think, by the Scanlon Institute showing that the level of social cohesion in Australia has increased over the last 18 months. Now, that is exactly what you would expect, because here's one of the extraordinary truths about humans. I've been saying all this stuff about how we're social creatures, we need each other, we're all one, we're interdependent, and we all are hardwired for cooperation, and we have this innate capacity for kindness, and yet we can be fragmented by the sort of trends I was describing. It needs some, sometimes it does need a crisis. It needs a catastrophe. It might be bushfires. It might be a flood. It might be a war. It might be a, a depression uh, or it might be a pandemic. But some kind of catastrophe that pulls us up short, that disrupts us. And what is the effect? I mean, in the, in the initial stages, stages, we often give way to panic or fear and behave badly. But overwhelmingly, and Australia is a beautiful example of this in action in the last 18 months, overwhelmingly what happens is a crisis reminds us that we need each other. A crisis reminds us that we are indeed all in this thing together. Uh, and suddenly we remember what it means to be human. Suddenly we're engaging in more spontaneous acts of kindness we're being more cooperative. We're rediscovering the importance of the neighborhood. We're thinking about people who are at risk of social isolation. We're a bit more responsive to the needs of the disadvantaged in our midst. And we're more prepared to make sacrifices for the common good. Now we've seen all that playing out in thousands and thousands of wonderful stories. And most of you I'm sure will have experienced this sort of thing personally, but all over Australia we've seen um, with some exceptions, sure, but generally speaking, the pandemic bringing out the best in us and reminding us of these uh, enduring truths about what it means to be human. Um, we, we have uh, recognised the importance of neighbours. We have recognised that we can simplify our lives a bit. Uh, we can live more flexibly. We've recognised we had to cooperate. We've recognised we had to make sacrifices for the common good. The big question uh, and it's implied in your question, of course, is whether 
we're going to hang on to these lessons. Uh, now you say, you, you ask, and, to, and to, of course a good question, can we get any encouragement from history? And I think we can. Um, during my research career, I spoke to hundreds of members of the generation who are now mostly dead, who were young adults during the Great Depression of the early 30s, raising a family in that appalling and distressing period in our history. Again, it was a global phenomenon, not just Australian, but very severe here. Unemployment such as we couldn't imagine today, virtually no social security support of the kind we have today. And many of those people I spoke to, there was a very common story that they told and it had two parts. Part one, it was awful. Uh, we really felt uh, that it was tough. It was a period of hardship and deprivation. We often wondered whether we were going to be able to put a meal on the table for the kids. And sometimes that was only possible because the neighbors pitched in. Part two, it was the making of us. It was such a shock to our way of life. It really forced us to clarify our values, to reorder our priorities, uh, to think about this idea of making sacrifice for the well-being of the of the whole community and so on. Uh, and those lessons never left us. That was the important thing that members of that generation typically said. Those lessons never left us. We became famous in our families as the people who would never throw out a piece of string or a rubber band or who would bake a cake when uh, someone new moved into the street. We'd go and welcome them. Um, uh, these things seem to be a dying art. Now, the question is, has COVID been a sufficient disruption for these lessons to stick? And obviously, that's what I'm hoping. That's, that's why I wrote the book, in a way, to say, let's turn the crisis into a revolution. Let's not just say, oh, phew, that's over. Let's go back to being the way we were. Let's say, hang on, what did we remember about what it means to be human under the influence of the pandemic wouldn't it be tragic? Wouldn't it be even a bit pathetic if we let those lessons go and just slip back into the way we were? We uh, might have some questions from the uh, audience now, if that's okay. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That sounds fine. Um, yeah. And uh, if you'd like to uh, stay here, you can. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, there is one question uh, that I have, uh, and that is about the title of your book, The Kindness Revolution. And I wonder whether you think we need a, revolu a kindness revolution or if we're in a kindness revolution. And this question is similar to one that Lena has asked all the way from Maine in the USA. Yes. And I wonder, Lena, if you might like to take yourself off mute and ask you your question, because I think it's sort of similar. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Hugh. That was great. Uh, uh, and Lindsay, uh, in spite of social media, can we have hope that the youth has been informed and made aware and therefore is kinder because of social media? It seems to me that teens are these days are kinder. Hmm. Yes, uh, thanks, Lena, and uh, thanks, Mark, for that. Um, yes, um, I, I think I think we do need a revolution to come to Mark's point. Um, um, but it's not a revolution. It's not it's not the kind of revolution that is is designed to change us. Uh, in the book, I'm not suggesting we all have to be different. All I'm suggesting is we have to be true to ourselves. It's a revolutionary reappraisal of what it means to be human. But I agree with you, Lena. I think there are some encouraging signs that younger people who've lived through this and, and younger people typically get a very bad press, but we need to remind ourselves that the so-called millennials and even the generation coming after them, they have had a fairly rough ride already. They, they are the offspring of our most divorced ever generation of parents. Uh, they've, they've lived through um, a, a very competitive educational environment, a very competitive um, job market, a very competitive housing market. It's been fair. And now this, uh, and I think this is going to produce a COVID generation rather like the depression of the, uh, rather like the generation shaped by the Great Depression. Um, the, the contribution made by social media to this, though, I think is a bit more controversial um, because I think we're still coming to terms with the fact that social media can be a very, very angry place. 
uh, a place where there's a lot of bullying, a lot of trolling, a lot of abuse. And that's because it's inhuman. <laughs> it's actually antisocial. Uh, when we're interacting with each other via the technology, we are not getting the satisfaction that humans need daily from eye contact, from face to face. Uh, in the same way as when we're hungry, we need to eat. Well, our social hunger every day can only be satisfied by face to face connection. And in the same way as if we get hungry, we get a bit angry. <laughs> Many of us do. I do. Uh, in the same way as if, if our social needs are not met, uh, many of us, without even understanding why, do become cranky and irritable and angry, which is why there is so much anger in social media. So social media has been a lifeline during the pandemic for people who've kept in touch with the people they love and their friends and so on. But it is a very hazardous place to spend too much time. And I think we do need to constantly alert our young people, but even ourselves, to recognise that spending too much time interacting with a screen at the expense of interacting face to face uh, with with other human beings is potentially dangerous for us. Speaking of danger, speaking of danger, uh, Jeff, come and just stand here. Jeff Jeffrey Little is going to ask the shortest question of his entire life. Jeff, come and stand here. Hello, here, right there. I'm going to shut you down if you. Um... I'm the sergeant. I can, I can, I can do what I like. I can use a bit of muscle today. But uh, <laughs> you've been, you've been a fixture for a long time, Hugh, and uh, you know, we've gotten to know and love you over many years. Come on. But I've got three, a three and one. Okay, and it only invites a short answer. Okay, but otherwise, Come on, President Jeff. Mark will kill me. Okay, we're observing today, and you may be aware, Saint Augustine, Saint Andrews, and Marcus Aurelius. And Stoicism, you've probably heard about those different philosophies from the, from the Greeks, not wanting to test your uh, your, your um, academia. But right. how does it relate to you and your, and how has it moulded your own views of the world, please? You might get an answer to that and question. In respect to this, of this particular talk today. You could read uh, Hugh's book and get a bit of an answer to that question because uh, they're mentioned in the book. But over to you, Hugh. Yeah, well, uh, well, I, I was asked to give the shortest answer in the world, uh, and it uh, 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 and it is short because I'm not claiming for a moment that this book is original work. I mean, it's based on a lot of original research, but what it's reflecting is ancient wisdom from the source, the sort of sources that Jeff just referred to, which shaped my early upbringing as well. Uh, raised in a Christian tradition, that was very influential for me, um, but. Uh, but what, what's influential are the core truths which appear in every religious tradition, every mystical tradition, every philosophical tradition, which is we are humans and we forget that we're humans at our peril. And knowing that we are humans, uh, we absolutely owe kindness, compassion, respect towards each other. Excellent, thanks, you, and exceptionally well done, Jeffrey. <laughs> well done. If uh, uh, is there a question from anybody else uh, here today? I can see uh, Glenn and also Ned and and Jeff have questions. As yes, if you're you'll, you'll need to come up here though. Um, but I wonder if whilst Jeff is making his way up, if Ronnie, you could cut your question down slightly, and just ask ask your question even shorter than Jeffrey's. We may, may have touched on a bit of it. There's a little bit of a generation gap between Hugh and myself. In my parents' time period, the expectation was that you would be married, it would be an instantaneous dual and subsequent household. Young people now decide not to get married and stay single. What things do we need to do for that one in four households to make sure that the kindness regime does continue? Hmm. Well, I have a couple of very short answers to that, Mark. You'd be relieved to hear. Um, one is, I think we are going to see a trend back towards multi-generation households. I, I think um, having too many solo households is probably socially unhealthy for us because it does raise the risk of social isolation. And I think we are going to see more young people staying at home longer, uh, perhaps having a child, uh, three generation household used to be the norm in Australia a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, the idea that the nuclear family was the 
was the household unit is a very modern idea. It really only came into fashion in the 1930s. So I think we'll see a bit more of that. Um, but there's no question that the marriage rate has fallen. Many young people see everything as a choice in a way that their parents and grandparents didn't. Will I get married or will I, will I live with someone? Uh, will I get married? Will we have a child? Uh, these are much more complicated questions than they used to be, partly because of the state of the world. Many people are now saying, why would you want to bring children into the world that we face? However, the other part of my answer um, to this is to say, recognising the growing number of solo households in our midst, recognising the risk of social isolation, for the people who, and therefore of loneliness, anxiety, et cetera, for people who are living alone, those of us who are not have a special responsibility to reach out and maintain contact with the people in our apartment block or in our street who are living alone to ensure that they are not at risk of social isolation. I think that's an important part of our responsibility as citizens, as humans, uh, to make sure that people who are living alone, some of them love living alone and they say, yep, I'm fine, don't, don't worry about me, but knock on their door and say, look, I just live down the road, we've never met before, I'm Hugh, I don't want to bother you, but if you need anything, here's my number. Um, I, it's crucial uh, for the health of our society that we acknowledge the risk uh, of so many solo households and work to minimise that risk. Um, hi, Hugh. And your question. Uh, thank you for your presentation today. Um, you do say we're hardwired to kindness, and I love the optimism you present. Um, but our society is also hardwired to tribalism. And I just wonder whether you'd comment on that. Um, and recently, we still tolerate an inordinate number of Indigenous people being incarcerated, uh, I think, because they're different to us. Uh, we still have refugees on Nauru, um, and we've just ignored them throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've closed borders. We refuse people the opportunity to come back to Australia. Our politicians seem to always want to divide and introduce legislation that divides the society rather than bring it back together. So I've got to ask you, can you relate your theory on kindness back to the fact that we are also very tribal. Yes, thank you for that. It's a crucial, a crucial question. I'm really glad you raised it because of course, part of our nature as social beings is that we become tribal. We think of the family or we think of our religious group or our professional group or our ethnic group as something we belong to. And we forget very easily that, it's, that, that the boundary isn't there, that there is no boundary. Uh, that it's not the Indigenous people over there and us here, we are all human. It's not the asylum seekers uh, stranded on Nauru and us here, aren't we lucky? It's not the poor people over there. We, we are poor. We have poverty. We have homelessness. We have incarceration. Uh, now, so that that is true. That is the dark side. That is the shadow cast by uh, our, our nature as humans. But it's also, of course, a, pro a problem that arises from the ego. The main thing that distracts us from our natural capacity for kindness is ego-driven impulses, which tend to be far more self-serving, of course, far more competitive, things like ambition, acquisitiveness, competitiveness, and so on. Uh, that we have that capacity as well, and that's the one we have to get on the leash. Uh, the, the ego is the enemy of kindness because kindness is all about others and the ego is all about me. Excellent question and well answered. Um, Hugh, thank you very much. I am now going to call on David Hirsch to offer a vote of thanks uh, to you and Lindsay for your um, presentation today. Thanks, David. Thank you, Mark and Hugh. Um, it's great to see you again. And you. Thank you, David. I know that uh, you, you're, you've, you've been a friend to this club uh, for many years. I've known you for many years and you always have something novel to, 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 to say. Um, and I wanna thank you on behalf of all of us for sharing your latest illuminations on the meaning of a good life and how to go about achieving it. You've made a number of important points 
um, th um, this afternoon. You've told us that COVID could be a game changer or a circuit breaker, if you will. And it's interesting to see that um, we have um, uh, an increase in cohesion because of COVID. And yet we have to resist the urge to go back to the way it used to be. Um, and the problem there is, of course, that seems to be the big political cell. Let's go back to the way it was. It's a cell that we have to resist as revolutionaries. Um, you've explained to us in the last 30 years or so that we've become a more hyper-individualistic uh, culture, uh, which has led to a fragmentation of the community uh, and more social isolation uh, and a proliferation of um, identity politics, which is not always helpful um, because we seem to be more interested in promoting our differences than that which we have um, share in common. But you've told us, Hugh, that our default position is kindness, uh, that we are hardwired for this and that kindness is a precious asset. Um, you've explained to us that the social media, social media can be a dangerous place, um, but what we really need to do is return to face-to-face -to -face contact. And that's exactly what we've had the pleasure of doing here at the Castaway for the first time in far too long. Um, uh, just to conclude on this point, um, Hugh, you've been advocating for us an approach uh, to living that is familiar to us as Rotarians, because as Bernard mentioned in his thought of the day, uh, we have a certain ethos in this tribe of ours, and that is we abide by the four-way test. We behave um, and promote truth, fairness, beneficial relations and building better friendships. That is what Rotarians have been, are meant to do. You've told us uh, that we need to be more um, uh, outward looking towards others rather than inward looking. And here uh, as Rotarians, we put service above self. So Hugh, in conclusion and in thanking you, can I just say that if there is to be a kindness revolution, Rotarians like us, can be in the vanguard. Thank you for reminding us of all that we can do to make the world a better place. And it's lovely to see you again. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate that.